for the budget. Uh, Dr. Tom Deichel will present. Thank you.
and uh, about 100,000 in seed debt, and the rest of them are all minor. So we're looking at about 4.2 million total in the operation fund. And these are all projected. Uh, in the operation fund expenditures, uh, we look at those. So you have technology, you have a central office people are here, you have transportation, you have custodial maintenance. So you can see the first four categories are all those people that I mentioned. 41,000, I put a million dollars in there for land, even though we have a million dollars in the proposed bond issue also for land. I just don't know what land is going for right now, how many acres we're going to need to buy in the future. But we need to look at purchasing land sometime soon for some future expansion. Uh, professional services went up a little bit. Uh, building acquisition went up about a half a million dollars. Skilled craft employees went up a little bit. Um, so overall, we're looking at about a four a four million dollar increase. Again, that's projected. It won't be that high. Now, one of the new things, since we got rid of our replacement, we still have to show what the number of buses we're going to purchase over the next five years. So in 2020, we're looking at eight buses at about 125 thousand dollars a piece for the buses. In 2021, five buses. 2022, 10 buses. 23, Those numbers are starting to change depending on the addition of some of our vehicles. And we also still have to do a capital projects list. So I put maintenance vehicles in there for 250, computer lab replacements for 100, phone books for 250, internet filters for 30,000. It doesn't make sense to me. It's all part of the operations fund, but yet we still have bus replacement, we still have uh, capital projects. In the rainy day fund, I'm asking them to transfer up to a million dollars if necessary. Hopefully, we won't need it this year. Um, and that's basically the budget itself. Now, I just wanted the next slide shows you the assessed value of how our, our AG has been going. Uh, I went all the way back to 2009, we were at 83 cents you know, per hundred dollars of assessed valuation. You can see the percent increase or decrease from uh, 2012 through 2014 on assessed valuation, which is the wealth of our school district, actually decreased. And then starting in 2015, it started to increase in 2 3.7, 4.7, 5.6. You can see our assessed valuation is $2.7 million now. Um, one of the major things that really hurts to schools is the tax cap loss. Now, you're not supposed to pay more than 1% on your assessed valuation of your home. So that was all uh, voted into the Constitution. I voted for it. I didn't want to pay more than 1% either. So you can see from 2010 through 2015, Clark County as a whole lost 51, almost $52 million. Greater Clark lost $12 million. Okay, don't ever get that money back. Then in 16, 17, 19, I show those individually how much money we lose, how much Clark County has lost. So since 2010, when this uh, went into the state constitution, Clark County has lost $119 million in property taxes. The greater part has lost almost $24 million. That's a big thing that we lose. Now, this is the expected uh, appropriations. And I always show this to the board. The education fund for 2019, we're at $64.2 million. We're advertising 66.9. I think we'll be somewhere around 65, 850. Once everything falls through, uh, and we'll see an increase of about a million five. In debt service, we advertise, uh, I'm sorry, we approved uh, 13.4 in 19. We advertise 13.4 in 20. Should be right around 13.4. The pension, uh, we're approved for a million two seventy. We advertise for a million two sixty seven. That's where we should be. In the operations fund, for nineteen, we were approved for twenty two point two million. We advertise twenty nine point seven, and we're expected to be about twenty three point four. So it will probably be about a one point two million dollar increase over uh, this year. And the rainy day fund is a million. So in two thousand nineteen, our whole budget was one hundred and two point million dollars we're advertising 112 we think it'll be somewhere around 105 so it'll be about a 2.7 million dollar increase now the next one is the expected tax levies this is the property taxes that we're looking to uh, collect um, in the education fund it's all zeros because it's all state tuition support in the debt service fund uh, for 19 16.3 million in 20 we're looking at 14 million 
advertise, and we think it would be about 13.875. The expected is all based on where our assessed valuation is going to be. As of today's, Clark County still has not posted their assessed valuation uh, for, for anybody in Clark County. I'm still waiting for those numbers. In the um, debt service, I'm sorry, in the pension debt, uh, we have to approve for 1.1 million. We advertise 1.6. We'll probably be around 1.4 an increase of about three hundred and twenty seven thousand dollars in the operations fund. Uh, we're at fourteen point almost three million this year. We're at we advertise fifteen point nine. We should be around fourteen point three, so a little bit of an increase. Money day fund is all zero, so you can see in nineteen we're approved for thirty one point seven. Uh, we advertise thirty one point six, we expect twenty nine point six, so we're looking at a two point one million dollars increase in our expected taxes. Now, the expected tax rates, this is what everybody's always interested in. Again, the education fund has no tax rate because there's no tax levy. In debt service, we uh, were approved for 58 cents. We advertise 61, we'll probably be about 56. In the pension fund, uh, we were approved for four. We advertise almost seven. We should be around five. In the operations fund, we are approved for 51, we advertise 69, we should be around 50. The main day fund is all zero, so all said and done. We're at $1.13 for this year, we advertise $1.37, we should be around $1.11, and uh, we can do it over the map once we find out what our growth is and our sales value Now, this is something, this is very simple and basic, how you can look at your, your tax rate. Um, if you have a $2 billion assessed valuation, that's the wall of your school district, and you have $25 million in property tax that you need to raise, your rate ends up being a dollar and a quarter. Now, say your AD goes up to two and a half billion, and you still need 25 million in property taxes, your rate drops to a dollar. Now, say your uh, your AD is only uh, drops from $2 billion to $1.5 billion, and you still need $25 million in property tax, and the rate jumps up to $1.66. So you can see how just by adjusting your assessed valuation, how it really fluctuates your, your tax rate. Now, the next thing is near and dear to my heart, uh, Clark County Tax Increment Financing Districts. We have a lot of, of uh, TIF districts, Tax Increment Financing Districts, in, Money. Um, as of 1231.17, the cash balance for all of Park County was 41.4 million, which jumped up 6.5 million from December 31st of 16. The <coughs> that was captured during that same time period went from 432 million to a billion dollars. Park County ranks number four in the state in cash balances uh, at 41.4 million. Allen County is number one at almost $80 million that they're sitting on in cash that's taken away from schools and other tax and units. Now, that gives you the overall for Clark County. Now, just looking at uh, greater Clark, Perry Crossing, the bonds were paid off. The cash balance there was $960,000, which was an increase of $117,000, and they captured $1.3 million of assessed valuation. All this assessed valuation that was captured is not in the greater cars tax rate. If we were able to bring all that in, I have a slide that will show you what our tax rate would drop if we were able to bring all that in. The sale of load, AD captured, is only 102,000, They don't have a cash balance there. In Jeffersonville, you have TIF 57, which is ICR's inner city road. Assessed valuation, that's up and down 10th Street, all that. New stuff in the country was 277.7 million. Their cash balance December 31st of 18 was 15.2 million, and that was an increase of 886,000 over the prior year. TIF 62 is Harbor Falls Landing. They didn't have any assessed valuation listed. Their cash balance was 3.5 million, so they had an increase of 175,000. Those values 24.5 million AV. Uh, cash balance 1.2 million. Uh, so they had 146,000. Yelp Star is 27.4 million. They're sitting on 2.4 million in cash. Keystone, uh, assessed by the 524, they're sitting on 530,000. Got an open 6.7. 
no cash balance, no increase, no decrease. Why don't you do these assess evaluations so we can bring it into our schools, lower our tax rate. Falls Landing, 77 million, cash balance is 137,000, so we have 4,000. So all posts, just in Jefferson, so they're sitting at 415 million assessed valuation that they can take away from the schools that we can't get our taxes on. Uh, the cash balance that they're sitting on December 31st of 2018 was almost 23 million, and that's an increase of 1.5 million over last year. In Charlestown, I showed the bonds is being paid off, but I don't know how accurate that is because I know they have that in the tip districts there, but I'm just going by what's reported on the Indiana Gateway system. Their cash balance December 31st of 2018 was 261,000, which was an increase of 189,000. And they captured and not released 26.6 million in excess valuation. Here's the good one now. Like Here River Ridge. Everybody thinks we're rolling in money because of all that growth at, at River Ridge. You got to understand, before this River Ridge, it was an army ammunition plant. We were getting impact aid money, and that dried up, I think, mean, two years ago. Our last payment was like 700000 that we received from that. So when you have a TIF district, you create this, this area. And whatever that assessed valuation is at that point in time, that's the basic assessed valuation. Then the growth is called incremental, and that's what they used to get their money for all their projects. And we don't get any of that growth. So because it was federally owned land, the assessed valuation was zero. So now they captured $2.6 million in TIP revenue in 18. Their assessed value is $386 million. They generate two and a half million in property taxes. And 15, you know, there, the law, there's an Indiana code that says schools may get up to 15% of the property taxes collected in the TIF district. We've been trying over the years to change that one word may to shall. That's all we're trying. We are getting so much opposition from the cities and the towns and the redevelopment commissions. So just on River Ridge alone, if we would have gotten 15%, we would have gotten an extra $383,000 in property taxes. Now, total assessed valuation not recognized for <coughs> all these TIF districts is $832 million. That's a chunk of money that, that is being withheld from our property taxes. So, I did a little number crunching here, and this is what our tax rates could look like if we use our 2019 information. So I'm looking at our current levy, of 2019, the current assessed valuation of 2.7, almost 2.8 billion, and our current tax rate. Then I added in that $800 million. So you can see in debt service, our tax rate would be reduced from 58 cents to almost 45 cents. The pension debt would go from 4 cents to 3 cents. Operations fund, from 51 cents to 39 cents. Rainy day, nothing. Overall, from $1.13 to 87 cents. So that would be a 26 cent drop in our tax rate. Now, the next one would be better. This one shows you how much property taxes we could have collected if we had gotten 15 percent. Um, so when you look at all the property taxes that were collected, say in 2018, for all the different TIF districts, was 17.1 million, 15 percent would be. 5 million and the last slide didn't show up or at the very bottom shows how much we lost in property tax caps. So basically, when you look at what the next slide, um, in summary, the 15% from 2011 to 2018, we lost $18.4 million. Uh, the tax cap loss, or we could have gained, I should say, we could have gained $18.4 million. The tax cap loss during that same time period was 18.7. So the net loss was we would only lost $315,000 over that same time period versus 18.7 if the redevelopment commissions would have shared that 15% with us. So the concern <coughs> that I always have, if you're not aware of it, there's a public hearing tonight and it started at 6 o'clock over at Malden Employee with Energy is looking to raise rates 15.3%, 5%. Um, in two years, um, you'd think it'd be like 7.5% per year, not like 13% the first year and 2 or 3% the second year. So if that comes through, uh, we're looking at about a $250,000 increase on our electricity bill to 
this book. So, then you look at your own households, which you're going to do. I already have been yelling at my wife to shut the lights on. Uh, in the TIF districts, uh, Utica has added two new ones. They haven't got to any assessed valuation yet, but that's going to be coming next. We have a lot of housing developments in our school district. That's scary. We've got five hundred going across the street. <coughs> and then uh, Charleston has, I think, 11 or 1,300 potentially coming up in Charleston. Uh, tax caps, that's always a concern. Staff <coughs> are having a hard time finding a lot of, a lot of uh, certified and uncertified staff. We're also trying to have a competitive wage. You know, we were offering $10 or $10.50 an hour, and we were fighting against McDonald's, who's offering $12 an hour in full benefits. Uh, you know, it, it's hard, and they're a for profit company, and we're not. We have to live within our budget. I can't raise the rates to anybody. So that's basically the budget presentation. Our budget adoption will be October 15th. I won't go through all of this. It will be much better and quicker. But I will be here to answer any questions the board may have. Are there any questions? I have one. Just to recap, I think I understood it, but just to make it clear for the people out there, if the TISP districts had paid, given us the 15% they're allowed to, then we would have been at the position where you say on taxes, so property taxes would have been considerably lower on all these taxpayers out here. Correct. Okay. I have a question, Tom. Um, on those TIF districts that you showed that had a zero balance, on paying back the bonds. They've already paid all the bonds. Um, I understand that they could continue to have obligations. Correct. Yes. So if, when we look at that, we can't assume that X number of million dollars is excess money can be distributed, as we know, any way they want. They can give it all to us. But if they have obligations pending, they have to keep a certain amount of money. That's why I understand about the River Ridge is they've got these, all these obligations pending. Yeah, one of the new things in the law, bless you, two more years ago, one of the things in the law says that they now have to have an annual meeting. An annual meeting. And I went to Marksville, because we have one of the other parts of the I went to Jeff, and I went to New Orleans, because I wanted to see what another county would do. And the, the presentations were basically the same. You know, they talked about each of the different TIF districts that they had. Everything was sugar plums and, and fairy dust. It really was. I mean, they were talking about how well everything was in the TIF district for the, for the city or the town or the community. One thing they never talked about was the effect on public schools. How much money are you taking away from public schools? The other law that was passed this legislative session said that if you are in a county with less than 100,000 people, and I'll, I'll refer to Crawford County, there, which is close to us, they're the poorest county in the school district, is what I understand. If they had a housing boom and their county wanted to create a TIF district, they can create a TIF district and pick up all this residential property, and the school would get nothing for them. Um, one of the things that they put in the law was they had to give the public information as far as how the TIF district would affect the public school. Well, lo and behold, the cities and towns got together and that was uh, taken out of the, the uh, law. So now they don't have to say that. And I think that's terrible. I think they should still have to talk about how TIF districts affect public schools. Um, it, it's just getting harder and harder. I mean, we're getting hit constantly. Why is it allowed that the city or town or redevelopment commission can take money away from the public school? We can't do it from them, but they can do it from us. They have multiple ways of doing it. You know, they can give a maintenance to a business. You know, they can give a 10-year maintenance. So each year you're paying 10% more in property taxes. So the first year you pay zero, the second year you pay 10, 40, 30, 100%. Then I heard they have a number of maintenance, which is a 20-year maintenance. And that's over 20 years that they can evade. So why do they need all these TIF districts? Hamilton County, okay, which is a very ritzy school area, which is Hamilton Southeastern School District, has 101 TIF districts. At what point in time is enough enough? There needs to be controls on these TIF districts. I'm sorry, I'm getting on my game. Yeah, it's true that Clarksville City actually does give us $6 every year. Yes, Clarksville has, uh, we're in our second 
three-year agreement with the town of Hartsville, and we get $160,000 for technology, and the uh, Hartsville Community Schools gets $240,000. So they give us $400,000 out of their gift district. And remember, they're pulling in about $7.5 million every year of the property taxes. Tom, could you go? Jeffersonville also gives us money. Um, can you explain oh, that? Yeah, yeah. Um, <coughs> um, when they expanded the Penn Street TIF district, we had negotiated with the Redevelopment Commission and the mayor that we would get up to 10% or $400,000 over the life of that TIF district. We finally got our first payment on property taxes this June. We got $4,648 or something like that. So it's a far cry from the $400,000 that we're saying we're getting. That may be 15, 18 years down the road before we see that and I'll be long gone. Yeah, and one other question. Uh, if district TIF districts were to be able to give us or or choose to give us the money to reduce our tax rates. And it also, because of what they take out, it reduces the money that we are able to collect on the property taxes. And the same thing happens, I believe you mentioned the same thing happens with the county. So the county doesn't for county roads, county services they have to provide. They lose money as well, correct? Correct. And, but the county also, Indiana has enabled the county to be able to collect a, a, a occupational tax too, yep. which the schools can't do. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, so the county loses money, but the county can make it back up by taking money of your paycheck. We can't do that. Another thing I wanted to make. Yes, I wanted um, to see if you could clarify for me on the tax rate that you projected. So right now our tax rate's a dollar thirteen six three. Um, you, you projected in twenty twenty that would be a dollar eleven seventy. Does that include the bonds that we're being asked to approve tonight? Yes, it does. Right. But it, and, and I think it'll be even lower because I think our assessed valuation will go up because mm -hmm. I really wasn't projecting much of an increase in the assessed valuation, so that will drop that tax rate. Thank you. Chavez and Thaddeus Dietrich, come on up. 
That's the boys' blue team. And let's go ahead and add the boys' white team, and we'll take that photo and then do the girls' groups, okay? JK Boys white team members include Cameron Lee, Josh White, Ben Fowler, Jackson Brody, Cash Richardson, Jacob Orr, Blake Thacker, Andrew D'Amatos, Trevor Branham, Landon Kunkler, Dallas King, Jonathan Gaddis II, and Alexander Rodriguez. The boys white team.
Any other questions? All those in favor of the agenda is Madison DeVore, 
Highway Twin Oaks Drive, Indianville, Indiana, 47126. Hello and good evening. I am currently a sophomore at Charlestown High School. I have taken band classes since the sixth grade, and my interest for that those classes have come from the musical classes that you currently have at the elementary school. I've had various teachers over the years, each one that was certified in that specific area, and they have all had one thing in common, which is a drive to teach musical theory to students. It is to my best understanding that if this plan is to pass, any person with an associate's degree would be allowed to teach the related arts areas in elementary schools. They will be given a lesson plan from a certified teacher in that area, but beyond that, they are left on their own. Yes, these plans can be very well written, very organized, and yet it is one thing to teach as a career and another to teach as a job. These classes are also a big influence on children. Elementary school is a six-year-long transition into full-time education. The seven-hour-long academic schedule can be tiring on young students. They do receive recess, but even that time can be limited. Related arts classes are a way for students to release energy and creativity in a structured way. Not only are they learning, they are having fun. Without the teachers who are certified in these areas with the desire to teach students those subjects, students will lose an interest in those subjects. If the teacher doesn't like the subject, neither will the students. And as a district, we pride ourselves in providing the best education to all students. Arts and technology are part of a well-rounded education. Why would we save money in strong educational programs and invest more in programs that do not benefit the students or their future education? Teachers who work in the current related arts positions have pursued this career their whole lives. Ripping them away from their beloved position and placing them in another is damaging to their life's work and life. It is the goal of these educators to teach the kids their passion. It is unfair to treat their jobs like an expense and not as vitally important as the classroom teachers. I care deeply for the future of Greater Clark and its students. As you vote on this plan, I ask you to think of the students like me, who are influenced by the caring and supportive teachers you have now. To think of the students who will lose value in these classes, without anyone to teach the appreciation of them. To not place a monetary value on creation or imagination. Job on the education part of it. 
I would use the athletic facilities as a sales tool to drive those kids a thousand homes from Salem Noble back toward Charlestown. They're either going to go here, or they're going to go to West Clark, or they're going to go to a private school, which we've already lost several several kids to, to Floyd County, to um, Floyd Central, uh, St. X. We're losing kids, and I think it's just four. Again, it's great academics. We're, we're losing one athletics. Thank you.
30 years, 40 years ago they have been built. I'm not trying to compare them to other facilities because I think I just want to reiterate that it is about the kids, about giving them the opportunity and a fair chance to compete at the same level as all these other schools. I have lots of friends from Northern Indiana come to Jeffersonville. They're like, are you kidding me? The weight room, the locker rooms, the field conditions, the bleachers. Unfortunately, it's embarrassing for me to fight friends. And I hate to do that because I love football, I love Jeff, and you know, my kids graduating. So I'm looking at all these kids back here and saying, this is for these guys, not for my son. That way I can come and see a, a corporation that cares about these kids, cares about the, the individuals and the way they are going to progress and grow, and not only as a student, as an athlete, and you know, as a young man or a young woman, or you know, the band will be able to, you know, be able to go on the field without falling in a hole or something. You know, or we have too much rain, we can't practice on the field. The consistency of the field the field condition is priority when it comes to football whether it's finding your plane marks for the band or whatever it is, it is crucial. I asked my son, I said, what's the biggest difference between grass and turf? He said, conditions. He said, you know, grass, you slip, you fall, whatever it is, you know, it is the opportunity for these kids to have a consistent playing field and a consistent <coughs> map, map out with everything, everybody else in the, in the same district, small school, big school, whatever they have turf. They go from grass to go play on turf. It's, it's different, different conditions. But I, I really look forward to seeing what you guys do on this. There's a lot of kids here from Charlestown, a lot of kids from Jeff. We'll make sure that you know, these kids don't get disappointed. Jeffersonville, Indiana. Um, I have been at Jeffersonville for high school for nine years. I'm the head athletic trainer there. Um, I agree with voting yes for this referendum for the uh, new facility. Um, my take on it is, like a lot of people have said up here, is it's a level playing surface across the board. Like if you go upstate or go somewhere and you see a field that's on a level, that's unfavorable conditions for our athletes out here. And that puts us in a bind because that promotes more injuries. So I just think it's level. Uh, the cost of it, I know it's a big hit off the top. But in 10 years, it's going to pay for itself. Without, if you thinking that um, going to bond care, pesticides, all the maintenance work that you have to do with grass fields, our grass fields are very kept good because our maintenance guys put in a lot of work. And I know they put in a lot of hours because I see them working because they're, they're as much as I am. So I disagree with everybody. I think it'll be beneficial for our kids coming up. Um, if we're going to compete against Floyd, against Warren, against all the schools that are projected to be a little bit bigger, and you know, that they think that are a little bit better, better than us, we need something that gives the kids a little bit drive to want to compete against them. And I say that they don't. It's just like, if we got nice facilities, if you walk into a nice facility, you're like, man, this is, this is cool. I can work with this. I'm going to go in there and get some work done. <laughs> you know? uh, so I just think, like, because, I mean, I've been all over the state. I've been in Jefferson nine years. I've been from Warren Central on down and Warren Central on up. I got, I got a ring with Chad when he was with the girls' coach. So I worked with Chad. So when you go to those bigger powerhouse schools and you walk in and you see that, or you see that field, you're like, dude, this is, this is good gym. This is good gym. And then you walk in that weight room and it's like real good, laid out, perfect. Kind of like, man, we're missing this with Jeff. 
kind of need this to help us out. But I also think we put a lot of money and a lot of time towards our education. And education is the key across the board, don't get me wrong. I got my school paid for for athletics, but it also got me an education. And I can't take that education away. We're, we are a Grammy Award winning school with our arts at Jeff. Why don't we take that, that, that Grammy Award winning arts and make it like, hey, we, we're a powerhouse at the bottom of the state. And that's, that's my time. several times over the past few years, primarily in support of our open concept building renovations uh, and to appeal for help relevant to the charter of the school pool. Uh, tonight I come before you again to request that you approve the strategic plan tonight as it relates to our facilities. For far too long, facilities have been the afterthought of Greater Park County Schools. In 2008, when CHS and JHS were renovated, improvements to the athletic facilities were cut. When the proposed remonstrance failed, improvements to the athletic facilities did too. When the facility study was completed in 2014, recommendations that expressed dire concern over certain aspects were left untouched. GCCS has historically saved money by reusing portions of older buildings, such as was done with CHS or the new elementary school in Jeff, that's applauded, but it's time to bring our schools into the 21st century. Currently, the football field stands and facilities at CHS and JHS are the same as they were when the schools were constructed. In nearly 50 years, no changes have been made. Following improvements to CHS in 08, the building and under the football stands was condemned. Running water cut off, and the building is still used for storage of athletic equipment, which we then asked our kids to handle the path. There is no locker room near the field, so players must gather in the trees at halftime. Over the years, I've witnessed players having to relieve themselves in the trees and huddle together in the cold rain. The press box is rotting at the bottom, and oftentimes use of the field must be withheld from various teams to keep from having it torn up. Track and tennis courts have obvious cracks that simply can't be prepared. Of course, the football fields aren't the only facility needing improvement. The middle school pool has been empty for two years now. Students must return to school at 5 p.m., take a 30-minute bus ride to New Wash, install landlines, swim, remove landlines, take another bus ride, return home at 8.30 p.m., go home, uh, clean up, eat dinner, then do homework until 1 a.m. Uh, high school and middle school programs have dwindled. In Charlestown this year, our summer program had to be shut down. Three years ago, we went from 70 kids in our summer school program to none this year. Uh, because we had to send them to other places because they were tired of having to travel. Uh, this only highlights a small portion of the needed updates to our facilities. The question, of course, to me is why? The answer is simple. Schools and business needs to be run accordingly. Uh, like it or not, uh, there's a lot of competition now. Uh, see, my time is running out, so I'm not going to get through everything I have to say. Uh, but I do want to say that the biggest reason to proceed forward with this approval is simply this. We owe it to our kids. We owe it to them to provide moderately reasonable places to play. We know the benefit of athletics as it pertains to academics. Um, I'm proud of our schools, but being proud is not the same as having pride. Uh, thus, I appeal to you tonight to please give our community something to be proud of, something which says that GCCS does care about all aspects of our students' lives and well-being, and that will have a lasting impact. Thank you, Mr.
Several items on the agenda. Have your others, please, if you are ready to present, please be ready. Like, yeah. maker. First item on the agenda is the old policy. It's a second reading, which does require action. It does for the evening. After we <coughs> presented this update to the teacher appreciation grant policy for first reading last month. So I'm here today asking for adoption for the second reading. As a reminder, the Indiana Code was amended this year to allow for a supplemental award to teachers with one of Stan's five years of experience. Um, who were rated effective or highly effective. After a discussion with the GCEA um, corporation discussion, it was decided that this would not need to be revised for this year. However, we did uh, leave that option available for subsequent years if we chose to allow for the supplemental report. Thank you, Ms. Scott Lanker. Board, do have a motion? Madam Chair, I'll move to approve the teacher appreciation grant. Second. 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 Second.
the Delta insurance premiums will decrease, albeit very minimally, but those premiums are also um, provided on the attack sheet. And these rates are guaranteed for two years. Uh, the dental plan is voluntary plan, so the employee does pick up all of the premiums for that. I move to accept the Anthem Dental Insurance Fund for 2020. Thank you, Mr. Fred Walter. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Patrick. Questions, comments? Thank you. Hearing none, all those in favor of adopting the dental insurance by Anthem 65 by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? And Vision Insurance for 2020. Finally, our vision insurance in the past, our vision has been bundled with our medical. Um, and at this time, our um, insurance option is for the vision to be singled out. So it is still a voluntary program. However, because this will be an additional cost um, on top of the medical rates going up, insurance committee has um, recommended that Greater Park be up 60% of the vision premiums with the employee picking up 40%. Um, the voluntary vision will benefits will remain the same as we've seen before, um, as the dental rule as well, the medical um, to mention that. So our employees will not see any changes as far as deductible for um, coverage budgets. We're asking approval of our vision insurance with Anthem as well, so all three lines of coverage will move to the I move to approve that we, I'm sorry, I move to approve Vision Insurance with Anthem for 2020. Thank you, Mr. Do you have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Rockwell. Your questions, comments, and I just have a comment. I, mean, I had several questions about the health dental and vision. That's what I did for 22 years. And April, I just wanted to thank you for finding the answers, calling me back, and being responsive. I appreciate that. Next on the item, um, it, on the agenda is the strategic plan and year one of the facility plan. Thank you, um, board. Um, first of all, let me say thanks to all of you for coming to the meeting tonight. Uh, and I also want to say that, or explain in scope what we're trying to do with this part of the action item. Um, you know, we've spent a lot of time the last five or six months developing a strategic plan that we could take out to our communities, which we did last week. We had great turnout at each of those events, uh, great feedback, um, and we wanted to make sure that you know, we, we listened to that feedback. And, and I'll share some uh, slight changes that we made in the strategic plan with you in a second. But tonight, with this part of the action item, I want to make sure the board, you understand that I'm just asking you to approve the broad scope of what's in the plan, except for year one of the facility plan. I will go into that and some other action items. Uh, I'm gonna ask you to take action on those uh, because there's a you know, timeline important there in terms of us getting moving on, on those projects. But within the strategic plan that I'm bringing to you tonight, I'm asking you to approve it in broad scope. Obviously, uh, we're gonna come back to you later after we get specific <coughs> detailed plans on what we're doing with the um, uh, preschool, you know, the potential buyout of uh, teachers and those type items, because obviously we want to bring those back individually, make sure we communicate to, that board, to the board and ask you guys to approve those items. Uh, I do want to mention that based on the feedback we got last week and over the last couple of weeks, there's a couple things that we amended or changed within the strategic plan. Um, one was that we're going to delay um, any, doing anything with the restructure of the related arts programs at the elementary level. Uh, we're going to delay that at least for a month, maybe two months. We want to study that a little more. We want to get more research um, on that. Uh, and then we'll make a decision at a later date. And I promise to, my promise to everyone in this room is we'll be very open and transparent about that, you know, moving forward. But we do feel like we want to delay that. We want to get in more, more information, more research before we make a decision or before I ask the board to make a decision on that. So that's one change within the strategic plan. Uh, the second item was on the River Valley pool. Uh, we've decided to keep the River Valley Middle School pool open uh, until it needs any major repairs. Uh, at that time, uh, we will reassess the situation when those major repairs are needed. Uh, and then, we'll, to be honest with you, based on the feedback we got, we're gonna take a hard look at 
you know, potentially could we do something with Jeff High at that point in terms of a major pool renovation? Uh, if that's three, four, five years down the road. So those two things have been changed. Um, I do ask the board to, to approve this strategic plan in broad scope so that we can get moving forward on um, really fine tuning the details of those plans um, that we want to bring forward later as action items uh, and, and get into place for next year. Thank you. Board Madam President, I move that we approve this plan uh, year one Thank you, Dr. Clayton. Uh, do I have a second? I'll show you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Questions or comments? Uh, I like to First of all, I want to thank everyone for your comments. And I, I feel very strongly that with Mr. Lochner looking at these situations. Uh, from 1971 to, uh, let's say, school year, 2020, Jeff High School uh, be 49 years old. We need to do work. To sit here and say that, well, we, we can afford we we can afford to do what we want, to do. and we I support improving our athletic facilities. Um, and the reason is like one person said when I was driving through Lawrenceburg and I looked at the track. In their football field. I was amazed. Now, I know they get money from the gambling folks, but still, our kids deserve it to, to have the same opportunity, equal uh, facilities, education as it's anyone else. So I stand supporting for the future to improve and not to just lag behind where we waited too long. And whatever we need to do to, to look at the finances, I know. Some school corporations are charging, and we haven't been charging. Uh, we've been giving a lot away, but we're at a point now that unless you contact the mayor, the legislators for these tip districts to, to move on a 15%, get us $2.5 million a year, we're going to be always going out of bond issue. So it's up to the community. What happens here today, we need to move forward. We need to let someone else hear the voice. There's nothing we can do uh, that the legislature says share. Doesn't say that they have to give us anything. So we need to contact those legislators and say, hey, we want our portion of tax dollars. That's all I understand. Just a comment. Um, I've been on the board 11 years, and I got more public comments and emails about this So I want to thank you, public, for reaching out to us and trusting us and your board to listen. We took your feedback, we went back to Mr. Lochner, and he listened to his board, and that's how some of these changes have come about. Um, the big three were the related arts proposal, uh, the swim uh, facility at River Valley, and the pre k um, we, we are resolving the River Valley swim facility and the pretty, uh, related arts proposal in the plan, I do encourage us to continue looking at the pre-K and especially, I don't want to see anybody, any kid have to be blessed. Uh, that's, I, that would be very difficult for me to say yes to. Um, I recognize pre-K is absolute the state should just flat out be paid for it because it's early learning and it helps kids for the rest of their career, but they don't right now. So um, just encourage us to continue looking at how we can keep our kids from being bus in the pre-K program. But thank you, Mr. Walker, for listening. Um, I appreciate it, and I know I will appreciate it. Thank you, sir. I'd like to um, add to that. I've been on the board not as long as you guys, but I've been on the board seven years. And again, this, um, and I went through the whole closing with Maple and, and Spring Hill and, and you know all that <coughs> I represent downtown. But this is the most that I this this strategic plan, I got more emails and more phone calls, more visits than any other issue. And again, um, as Christina said, 
uh, it's made a difference and I really appreciate the fact that I was able to hear your voice and what concerns you about this because I changed my mind based on some of this feedback and the thank you Mr. Lawton for inviting us and having us at those those meetings where we got to listen to the public even though we went Jeff I went to 115 <laughs> <laughs> and the last thing I like to, to say is well a couple things I think greater I worked in another school corporation for 40 years and I think Greater Clark has, I think this gentleman right here says, we got it going on. And we need to make sure that we provide an unsurpassed education for all of our kids, and that includes our athletic facilities and everything. But the thing that you said, sir, about this is like a business, we have to sell ourselves that is so true to me. I mean, if you can take your kid and go to another school corporation because you think it's better, that just, you saw how much money each student brings in. So thank you for that comment, and I thank all of you for coming tonight and coming to that meeting at Jeff Island last year, the last 15. <laughs> <laughs> Anything I just want to thank the gentleman that came out whose child was graduating this year. He came out in support of that. And that's kind of hard. I think, you know, the corner that we're turning, and, or maybe we've been, we've already turned, you know, we're pivoting and, and moving in another direction. It's awesome to see these athletes here. You know, if you go, I'm in a lot of schools in the state. It's not like, like there's, there's Wayne Township, Pike Township, um, Ben Davis High School, the university exploded right there. And it is like a, a very small college. You know, you know I mean, it's just, it's huge. So I'm not saying that, that that's everything in the world, but there is a, a point where being proud of your facilities and, and taking it to that next level, you know, when kids run out there and feel really strong about the support they have, it's obvious from the parents that we've heard from. And I've been on the board 10 months and this is the most I've heard about. From anybody else, <laughs> but I thank you very much for that. So let's just keep moving forward, and, and you know, growth comes sometimes with conflict. And I just appreciate the heck out of you all, you know, putting your, your comments out there. So thank you. I know I haven't responded to a lot of emails, but I promise I will respond to everyone after tonight. <laughs> uh, anything else? For you? All those in favor of approving the strategic plan and your one of the facility plans, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Thank you. Uh, board, I'm asking the board to approve a letter of engagement with Steeple, who will be, uh, they will be our uh, underwriting uh, bond uh, municipal securities team. Um, this allows us to engage and discuss with them about future bonding as we go in, in, down the road with our financial or, or our uh, facility plan. So I'm asking the board to approve this engagement letter with Steeple. Uh, motion. I need a motion. move to approve the letter of engagement. Thank you, Mr. Walter. Do you have a second? Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Patrick. Do you have questions? Hearing none, all of those that approve the letter of engagement with simple, uh, Mr. Walker presented, can come and say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. All those that approve uh, the I'm recommending to the board uh, the approval of our financial team as we move forward with potential bonding. Um, that team would be made up of Stiefel, um, also Piper Jaffrey, David Wimmer, and also Thomas Peterson, who will be the bond council. Um, on the first two projects in the facility plan in terms of the transportation uh, facility and the swim pool at uh, Charlestown Middle School, uh, Stiefel will be the lead underwriter and Dave Winter and Piper Jaffrey will be the co-underwriter in this model. 
after those two projects, then Steeple will be the lead um, underwriter for the rest of the projects. Um, we feel good about this team. Uh, we're really taking uh, a different approach to how we get things done in this district. Uh, and that approach is really trying to manage the tax rate. You know, I, I talked in the community meetings quite a bit about trying to keep the tax rate at $1.10, which would allow us to get a lot of things done uh, because of what you saw uh, in Dr. Dyker's presentation in terms of the assessed value going up. And, and we're at it, you know, with the interest rates where they're at right now, the assessed value, assessed value going up right now, there's a lot of things that we can get accomplished without uh, a negative impact on the taxpayer. Um, and, and I think this team will help us uh, help provide us support and the services we need to make sure that we manage that tax rate well uh, and we don't negatively impact the taxpayer. So I'm asking the board to approve that financial team. Thank you, Mr. Lockhart. Board evaluation. I have a question. I hope that we approve the financial team so that's uh, Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Clayton. Questions or comments about the financial team? Right? Hearing none, all those in favor of approving the financial team is presented by Mr. Walker, State Department, and saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Next on the agenda is authorization of bond. Yes, um, within the strategic plan is the uh, year one of the facility plan. Uh, we, we, like I said, we you know, went to all the community meetings last week, got a lot of feedback, um, feel good about what we're trying to do with year one of this facility plan. We, we think it impacts all of our communities uh, very well. We think that you know, we'll be able to get a lot of done um, in terms of improvements. Uh, and not only the necessary improvements, but also they'll benefit our student athletes, also our transportation uh, department. Uh, they'll benefit many different schools in terms of just the environment within those schools. Uh, so I ask the board uh, for approval of bonding for year one of the facility plan as presented. Thank you. Uh, board to have a question. Madam Chair, I move to approve uh, authorization bond. Thank you, Dr. Second. Thank you, Ms. Perkins. May, could we put those, could we put that up there?
Yeah. As you can see up here, or did see up there, there's $2 million in football fields that are being asked to be, uh, be bonded out. And uh, I did a lot of research on this. I'm in construction, some of you know. I don't have some, have some, con <clears throat> some contacts in the business. I went back and forth on this uh, a couple of different times. Uh, first, I was first I thought I was going to say yes, no, no questions asked. I started looking at the data out there and digging into the internet, and I realized that there are some that are opposing visions on this as well. One of the one of the things I did find out very quickly was that there are two very highly competitive organizations, of groups of people, groups of organ companies that are. One on one side, they want grass fields because that's what they sell, that's what they service. The other on the other side, they want turf fields. Trying to make some kind of a middle ground between those was nearly impossible because they're both so focused on what they want. Therefore, it was very difficult to be able to come to any kind of conclusion with that information. I finally contacted a company called uh, Civil Design Incorporated that does design these fields, both grass and turf. And they indicated that there are advantages to grass, but there are also advantages to turf. Grass fields may cost less in the initial investment. There's no doubt about it. I'm not going to hear from some of my constituents about that. But the bottom line is to be properly designed as a grass field, it needs the drainage under the field. The same thing that the turf fields have to have. And without that, you still have a long lead time whenever you have a wet condition with your turf with your grass field. Therefore, the initial cost between grass and turf reduces dramatically from what you may see on the internet. The second thing is the turf fields do allow us to get on the fields much faster. They allow us to use them in a, in a much more intense manner. Uh, many times for grass fields, even whenever they're properly done, properly drained out, you still only are going to use them once time, one time a week, or otherwise you're going to damage the field. Therefore, the turf allows us to put the band on it so they can practice uh, this uh, uh, Ms. Hutchinson and I both ended up practicing on, I think I don't know where you did, I did on Parkview's East parking lot. Mr. Davis used to drive us, he was he used to be a uh, uh, marine drill instructor. He had little, little patience with us being out there on a hot asphalt field. Um, the second thing is that the grass takes nearly a year to be able to develop properly. It has to grow, it has to be able to mature, it has to be brought to, brought to maturation, maturation before you put people on and start playing. That would put our fields out of use for one year, and I don't think that's a very good thing for us to have. The last issue is that, uh, Mr. Loftner brought up that whenever we go in, so many of these things that you see up and saw up there are safety related. Absolutely, we have to do it. We have buildings that are condemned, we have buildings that are, are bleachers that are unsafe, and we have a lot of things up there that are going to be done that are implied by the safety that we have to provide for the buildings, the heat, air conditioning, humidity control, things like that. For us to do the safety related issues on these two fields and not do the fields, not do the turf fields is ridiculous. It's counterproductive common sense wise. We have in my business what's called as general conditions. That's the cost that it costs to manage the project, oversee the project, provide everything for it. You're going to have that on any project you do. If you do the bleachers one year, you do the uh, press boxes and other stuff another year, there's a second set of general conditions. You do the turf fields a third time. There's three sets of general conditions which can run anywhere between 15 to 30 percent of the project. That's the savings that we recognize if we bundle these all together, which is what Mr. Loeffner wants us to do. And therefore, that's the reason why I'm going to get some flack about this. I'm going to go ahead and vote for this and, and pass, pass along my, uh, my approval. Thank you for all the bumbling and saving. <laughs> <laughs> Next time we'll set a timer. Next time we'll set a timer. Three minutes. Go on. Say your name. Uh, I did go back and forth on the turf. So, um, I don't know if it's good for it, but when he said the marsh made a good job, I was like, I'm sold. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but thank you, and we do really appreciate the fact that we got it. It was very positive and and very supportive, even if it was an opposition. All right, any last comments, questions on the bond? That's what we're still on, right? All those in favor of authorizing the bond uh, for the year one of the facility plan is presented by saying aye. 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 All those in favor? All right, Dr. Dyke has the next couple in. Less words is better. <laughs> Go. All right. Hey, you know that's not a good idea. Um, 
you like to add the workers' compensation to our wellness clinic, which will allow our employees now to go to the clinic to work with any injuries when the clinic is open. Currently, our employees will go to OMP in Hartsville, and if OMP is closed, then they go to the Memorial Hospital, which is a higher charge for emergency work. With the variable hours our clinic offers, it's feasible for our employees to go to the clinic as much as possible, and if the clinic is closed, they would also start to go to the Memorial Hospital for services. The savings would be on the doctor's charge since we are already paying Dr. Burr and Eric as our nurse practitioner, but the clinic would send us an invoice for any medicine used and any lab work that was done. These charges would then go to the fund that that employee is, is charged to instead of it being paid out of our self-insurance fund, um, which is our employee's health fund. So we're asking permission to uh, amend the contract with Wellness for Life and Workers' Comp Triage to the contract. Last year, just as an example, we paid out over $100,000 for work with count injuries. The year before, it was like $230,000. So there could be some substantial savings. It just depends on how many people are injured during the course of the year. A lot of them are you know, trips, falls, things of that nature, that you know, bites that can be handled at the clinic during the working hours. So superintendent recommends approval that we have. This one through the insurance committee also. Um, Mrs. Gellmaker has also reviewed the contract. Thank you. But the superintendent recommends approval of the workers' compensation in addition to the wellness for life contract. Thank you. Dr. Bex, uh, before I have a motion to approve the contract with wellness for life for adding workers' comp triage. Madam President, I move that we accept workers' comp addition to the wellness for life contract. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Do you have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Gilkey. Questions, comments? Just one question for clarification. So, by saying they are doing the workers' comp triage, does that include necessary drug testing? So they're going to have to go to a different oh, wait, facility? Wait, wait, wait. Like for workers' comp? Okay, I'm sorry, yes, that was included. Because they are different So for injuries that require drug testing? All that will be done at the Wellness for Life Clinic. We're not going to have to subcontract out. Okay. During when the clinic is over, we'll still be able to handle that. Thank you. We did, we did get a separate panel on a different price for like seven panel drug testing, for example. Okay. Thank you. 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 Uh, insurance gave them ten thousand dollars for the injury. Is that inclusive of that or is it separate? This is just for medical. <coughs> just medical. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Craig. Any questions about the board? Did you say we are self-insured on the workers' comp? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? All those in favor of approving the contract as well as for life and workers' comp triage should probably say aye. 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 All those opposed? Authorization to advertise for architects and engineers within your one facility plan. Less work. Uh, we would like to explore. I'm going to skip the first sentence. We would like to explore the possibility of using this type of contract to help with the replacement of inefficient equipment such as lights, HVAC systems, pumps, etc., with energy efficient equipment as a way of reducing our energy costs. These are there are advantages to using this program such as getting a large amount of work done. Uh, quickly, no architect engineer costs, no advertisements to name a few. On the con side, we would be committing to paying them from the energy savings for up to 20 years, depending on the length of the contract, from our operations fund. Uh, so we wouldn't see a full reduction. Yeah, this oh, is the wrong, you're on the wrong thing. Yeah. That's 11. Sorry, we're on 10. Um, <laughs> at, because there were a lot less words on this. Oh, okay. um, there was just like two sentences, and then you were talking to one. Yeah. I know, that's okay. You're super excited about that. Cool. Uh, uh, authorization to advertise for architects and engineers from year one. Uh, the administration is requesting permission to advertise for architects and or engineers for year one of the facility plan for projects that are over 150000 which is a great loss that we have to bid. And if we have to bid, then we need to have an architect and engineer from the drums. So we are requesting permission to advertise for architects and engineers and they bring the recommendations to the board at a later date for your approval. Thank you. I just need to get the first ball right. um, Board, do I have a motion to authorize um, the advertisement of in architects and engineers for the year one facility plan? I'll 
make Madam President and I move that we advertise for our Texas Future Year One facility plan. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Walter. Questions, comments? Yes. One question. Whenever we advertise, it's going to be an advertisement for all this bundle at one time, or are we going to be able to differentiate between different architecture engineering firms for different projects? It'll have to be. It'll be as one, but then they can pick and choose, so we're going to see what's the advantage. Can one person handle it all? I don't know. I don't think so. I will tell you right see. now that I see that they can't. Oh, I would think so. Because we have too many things like the football fields. An architecture firm cannot handle that. Right. They just don't. They're going to have to subcontract it out. We'd be better off. It'd be better. Be better served if we be able to break this up some. Same thing with the swimming pool. There you go. Okay. Thank you, Charles. Any other questions, Scott? Thank you, board. All those in favor of authorizing to advertise for architects and engineers for the year one facility plan, so you probably saying aye. 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 All those opposed. And now you are pretty much all the way through this one. Yeah. Uh, authorization to advertise for guaranteed energy savings qualifications. So on the con side, we've been committing to paying them for the energy savings for 20 years uh, from our operations fund, so we wouldn't really see the full reduction in this fund. One new way is still to issue a bond to pay the energy contractor so that the energy reduction is seen 100% in the operations fund, and the repayment comes from the debt service fund, but the tax rate would increase. That's the con side. Uh, since it was, this would be our first time using a guaranteed energy savings contract, we'd like to explore all avenues of financing for this project and then make a recommendation to the future board. So what this is, is we're asking for qualifications. There's about 12, 13 companies that are certified by the state of Indiana as being energy savings contractors. So we, I sent the request for uh, proposals or qualifications to Bill and, and John and asked them to look at it. They gave me their input back. And we've done some changes to it. We lowered it. Because the first time we did it, that was a mistake on that, but we prematurely had to advertise. Um, one of the conditions was you had to have 20 years of experience in guaranteed energy savings. Well, that eliminated a whole bunch of companies that are out there. So we lowered it to five years. We added more things in there like how many times did you miss your guaranteed energy savings? How much did you pay? Things of that nature. Um, do you have any pending lawsuits against you, things of that. So this will give us a list of companies that can qualify, we'll analyze it, then we'll come back to the board and we'll say, yay, or, you know, we'll actually be yay or nay to go ahead with this guaranteed energy savings. It may be something we, we, we may want to look into for changing lights and HVAC and the pumps and motors and you know, the variables and drives and things of that nature. Try it for one. Time, maybe not to exceed 10 years, something like that, maybe, or do a bond issue and do it the same way. I'm always interested in new things. So. Thank you, Dr. Nagel. I'm sorry. But there were a lot of words. That's okay. I understand. Don't understand. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, board, anybody? Madam Chair, I move to uh, approve the authorization of advertising for guaranteed energy safety. Thank you, Dr. Clayton. Do you have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Questions, comments? A couple of questions. Help. Uh, you know, we've talked about this a few times, and I've also talked to April about it. I still do not understand why we are doing an RFQ when we already know there are about 12 companies in the state of Indiana who are qualified. Why are we not doing an RFP? Okay, the request for qualifications is we're just trying to narrow this field down to one company that we want to talk to. Then we will show them the amount of work that we want to get done. If we did an RFP, that means you're going to go, you're going to go ahead and just do like a regular bid and just have them come in and bid. But you the way the law reads, I mean, Bill, help me here. The way, I, the way I understand it and the way I know that one company is already volunteered to come in and do, they have to go through our entire campus, look at everything to be able to come up with what they think they can do. Different, like different companies are coming with different sets of scope support that they have to perform, that they feel that they want to perform for us, which means they invest a lot of time and effort into those into those qualification forms that they come up with. Then after they do that, then they come back and they present a, uh, a pro proposal for what they would want us to do. The way I took this, and tell me if I'm wrong, this is very, what you're asking us to do now is very similar to what happened whenever we chose between core Shireman and the other company for a design build projects. Is that what yeah, that, that would be a good way of doing it because they did spend a lot of time 
going through the drawings and, and meeting with us, it'd be the same way. I mean, they ask six or eight companies to come in, give us a proposal, and they're going to spend hundreds, thousands of hours going through our schools, looking at our facilities, and then they're not going to get anything for it. So this is the way that the law reads, that we have to do requests for qualifications, and then from there we pick one company, we sit down, we give them the scope of work that we want to look at. Say, so we just want to look at Jet Hot and change all the lights there from TH to LEDs. Give us a proposal. That way they know what the scope of work is. You just said the law says we have to do this. The this. law says that we have to do a request for qualifications. Now that I'm thinking about that. I, I guess my problem is we're looking at one company yes. that had no a, comparison because we select one company, they can give us any amount. We have nothing to gauge that on. So I can understand, I don't care how much time they put in, if they want the job, the neighbors, they come in, give it, and then we look at the best one. Well, why can't we have one company come in and evaluate and then do a bid proposal based on? Well, because, uh, because everybody doesn't see the same thing. Well, we also have to pay them for the proposal. Right. But then we're not locked into one company being able to charge us whatever they want. I'm very uncomfortable with, I'm having a hard time understanding how this is advantageous for us. Um, if we are, if we just narrow it down to one company, them telling us what we need to do. I, 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 I'm having a hard time understanding the, how that is advantageous for us as far as getting the best person for the best price. Well, I think they get the best person for the best price. They, they're um, vendor neutral. So they they shop out. They come in, they look at things that just go for the things that need to be done. And then they go out to what they feel like is the best vendor to complete those tasks. And then they bring that back to us. I still don't know. I don't know they guarantee the savings. Yes. That's the thing is if, if they make the mistake, they pay for the mistake. Look. Well, it's my understanding of Thomas Kramer from nothing in the RFQ is binding. Right. You know, that we're just getting the qualifications from the different companies that could potentially come in and do energy savings for Greater Clark. And you know, we're not bound to anything by doing the RFQ. You know, now once you get the RFP, you know, then you're, you're getting into a different ballpark. But, you know, these companies just come in, you know, and allow, it's almost like the letter of engagement to some extent, too. It allows them to come in and look at our facilities and get an idea of what kind of savings is there. Yeah. Why would they spend their time, though, like Bill said, why would they invest lots of time, which is money, into doing something if we're not bound to do business with them? I mean, they're not. What we're looking at is whether we want to buy, whether we want to buy a new car from Sam's brain surgery and used car lot over here, or we want to, we want to buy a new car from Coil Chevrolet. Who's more qualified? To well, be we already know that based car? on state qualification. The difference between an RQ and a Tony RQ doesn't always proceed in RFP, but it can. <clears throat> it just uh, from the research I've been doing here, it. A lot of government agencies put out RFQs because you're basically pre-screening companies before you ask for a quote. So you're getting, you're narrowing the companies down. Um, and maybe we don't narrow it down to one, you know, I don't know, because you said, you know, there's 12 out there, you want to narrow it down. So maybe we don't narrow it down to one, but it, an RFQ is a very common, you know, things that government do just narrow a focus. I don't have a problem with the RFQ. The problem I have is, letting one person's opinion versus someone else. I mean, if we're in this circle and someone's in the middle, we're looking at a different perspective. We don't see the same thing. So they could miss something and come back and say, well, you know, I really missed that. Now, generally we pay for that. You know, all those errors that we have been seen in the past, we pay for that. So I'm just saying I'd rather see one two or three people come in there and, and, and do a study if they want the, if they want the job. Well, I think that's what this is. Yeah. It is a study, and it's it's a study that we don't pay for, right? and, and they're going to bring it to us. And yes, they're going to put hours in it, but they also know going in, it's the way the process goes. And if they 
you know, they've got to just go out and search the best vendors. They've also got to guarantee the work that comes in. That's the part that I was studying on is if, if they make a mistake in something they bid, they pay, they pay for it. Yeah, if they tell us that it's going to save us $100,000 yeah. a year in but that cost, and it doesn't, then they pay the difference. Correct. And there's no change orders. And there's no change <laughs> orders. And, <laughs> and that's what they thought. Yeah. And the RFQ means nothing more than they're going to come in and tell us what they can do. How do they so, make money? Well, they're really good at what they do, and they no, I mean, seriously, how does this company? Well, they're, they're one. Their money. companies like this are huge, and so they're not just working with the Greater Park County Schools, right. they're national. So Isn't for them to so say we're going to buy, you know, so many commercial LED lights, I mean, they're buying every company. There's no one company here. Right, exactly. So but but there's, there's a bunch of them. Yeah, there's no. a bunch of them. This is the search for company. Here's, so how, they, here's how they make that money. Okay. Under, I'm trying to understand. Under okay. the energy savings contract, they want a long-term commitment from the school club or from the owner. So they want a 20-year commitment. So if they're going to say, we're going to invest, say, $10 million, you're going to pay me $500,000 a year for the next 20 years or whatever it comes out to, that's how they're going to make their money because there's going to be a market on it. There's going to be interest charged on that. And that's what I don't like about it because you're, you're committing your operations fund, the savings. You know, you're going to save, say, $500,000, but maybe four fifty dollars of it goes to pay them over the next 20 years. I'm only seeing a reduction of $50,000 a year in my operations fund. If I did like the normal way, did a bond issue, yeah, tax rate goes up but I can pay it off in three years or five years or seven years. If you're doing electrical energy, your payback should be between five and seven years. I'd go as high as 10. To go off 20 years on a payback, that's ridiculous. I mean, by 20 years, who knows, LEDs will be out the, the door and we'll have something to do with it. So this is just a research. This is just to authorize yeah, advertisement to research. To research yeah. a company, we may not go with it. We may, we may not, not go We may choose to find a company instead. Yeah. 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 One of these companies is you don't hire an architect or an engineer. That's their responsibility, just like right. it was when we did the design and build. We didn't hire any architect or engineer. I mean, we had Jamie Lake and, and Tom Durkin as advisors because they had we had to have that for the DNA code. But they always brought in an architect into the into the meeting, all the meetings that we had with each group. So that's an, that's a savings. I mean, you're looking at a big amount of money. I, I'm intrigued by it. But I'd like to start small, do a small project, see how it works. Well, all we're asking now, right, is to research these companies yes. and look at them uh, for their own qualified, we assume. Perhaps how long they've been in business, like you said. Have they have they missed any of their their deadlines, their their budgets? Uh, do they have any pending lawsuits? So we're okay doing that that research on these companies. Well, Janelle, I want to I want to bring up one other thing though that's really bothering me. It's my understanding that one of these companies who may be putting in on this helped de design our qualification questions. You don't think maybe they possibly could have designed the questions to. Have we asked the question? Because it was too restrictive. I mean, Mr. Yeah. Walker and myself, Todd Gibbons, we all had gotten emails, phone calls from pr proposed vendors to so have a deal in the guaranteed energy savings contract saying, I can't, get, or I can't give you a proposal because it's too restrictive. And one of the things was 20 years of experience. So we lowered it to five. Um, Tom, 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 were you? Walk me through or walk us through. We've also been through this tonight, okay? What start? What happens? What happens? Then we put an ad in the newspaper. Okay. We get the qualifications. The companies will submit their qualifications based on the RFQ that we submit. That we okay. Then we analyze it and then we'll decide what we want to do. Do we want to go forward with them? We'll see what they're going to charge. I want to see how well they hit their marks. So instead of a request for a proposal where they're going to give us an amount of money saying we can do this for that much money, this process says 
here's our qualifications, here's why you should hire us. Correct. Okay. And then we will give them yeah. a project or projects to look at and to come back with numbers for us to handle. So we're not narrowing it down to one thing with this, one person, one person. We could if we want to, but we could narrow it down to two or three and then do but it I mean, like a bit. Not the beginning of the process. No, no. Not. Right now we're, we're, looking, we're looking to see who's okay. out and to be And to be clear here, we don't have to take the 20 year finance Correct. option. We can, we can, we had a cash balance and we can pay and we can pay them. If we want to do half and half, we can do half and half. And make it a it, so it's, it's very flexible. And this, this is approved by the state. It's not something that some big companies are dreaming up. It's been approved for schools. Okay. That's, okay. that's the extent of where I'm at. It's like, it's okay. Well, and one of you mentioned the savings you get on the architectural side, the engineering side, because they have those people in house. The other thing that you know we haven't talked about is you know right now we're currently paying the vendor almost a half million dollars just to control our systems, HVAC systems. You know, and a company like this comes in and controls those systems for you. You know, you're you're saving that half million dollars a year, you know, immediately um, if you go down this road. You know, they, but, have, they have an incentive to control the systems to save us money because it either puts money in their pocket or it gives them a percentage whenever we buy, we buy yeah, it out. Yeah. So if it doesn't say what they tell us it's going to say, they, they eat it. So, I mean, I don't know. It's just, but I think it's worth at least okay. in, at in investigating a little more. Yeah, and then if it turns out that we don't want to do it, we don't want to do it. You know, they're going to put the money or they're going to put the time in. One of the things I can guarantee you energy savings contracts, what they would do is they would throw everything, including the kitchen sink, to hit their numbers. You know, they would say, okay, you know, these are, say, these are TA lights, and uh, we're going to go to LEDs, so you know what? LEDs last, say, 100,000 hours versus 10,000 hours. So you're not going to have to change that light bulb as much. So you're going to save the maintenance guy or the custodian for changing that light. At $50 an hour over the, you know, one year, that's how many times that he's, you know, and not have to change that light bulb. And my concern is, you know what, I'm still paying that person 40 hours a week. It doesn't matter if it's changing that light bulb or sleeping the floor. I want to see hard dollar savings in my energy bill. That's why I want to see savings. And all this other, of course, baloney that you throw in there, I don't want to see it. So that's one of the things that we would negotiate to say we want hard dollar savings. We don't want all that other fluff that you throw in there. This, this RFQ does not lock us down to taking all that. It allows us to be able to evaluate on the situation in terms we want to. All right, I call for a vote. All those in favor of authorizing to advertise for guaranteed energy savings qualifications signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? No. All those abstained? Thank you so much, Dr. Michael. Thank you, Ward. I just pulled the call for a vote thing because we're not happy. <laughs> I appreciate everybody's questions. Approval for Indiana Testing Incorporated contract uh, 2019 to 21. Better than like seven or like five seconds. Oh, okay. <laughs> We're saving money. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're going to call for a month. Yeah. So, I've worked with this company before. Um, they've got a lot of references. They're working with a lot of school corporations down here. And, and you in the bio and in the description that, that we are saving about $2,050 estimating if we run the same number of drug and alcohol tests that we had in the last average of three. So I would recommend that you, you approve this contract with ITI. Again, it's only for our drug and alcohol DOT uh, drug testing. Thank you. Board to have a motion for approval of the Indiana testing. Move to approve Indiana testing with ITI. Second. Thank you, Mr. Rockwell. Do you have any questions or comments? Question. Now, on that $15, is that on just one run or is that per person when they come down? The way I read it, it's like they, there's a fee when they come down, just $15. Yeah, it'll be our four, yeah. Okay. So we'll swap a bag that we, you know, for post accident or for any of the others, but they'll, right. they'll run through. But on site, when they come down, it's $15. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and the other question you said there wasn't any. It was just DOT, but what I read was that also included the non DOT, so it was $45 versus. It'll be, we will not use that for non DOT. Our non DOT, I think, 
But you put it on, yes. yeah, you put it on the form. So you have the option <coughs> if you want to. Yes, sir. Thank you, Thank you. Oh, hold on, I'm not through. <laughs> That's what you would do for your, your subs. Uh, not your sub, but your um, chauffeurs, bus monitors. Yeah, yeah monitors. Monitors. you have the ones that are not certified. They would have a free employment drug and alcohol screen that we would use the clinic now. But you, but you wouldn't use, you wouldn't make them a part of your regular screening? They're not just, part of it. Just one time? It doesn't matter if you drive. People do need drugs. <laughs> do yeah, I, I put my chauffeurs on the random pool. Okay. Yes. Chauffeurs. Anybody's driving, whether it be in the, the Fort Escape or an activity bus or a, a school bus, they are in our van. Thank you, Dr. Anything else? Any other questions, comments, please? All those in favor of approving the contract to be as if incorporated there at the attached billing rate. Student practicing, aye. Aye. All those opposed? Thank you. Next is um, the McKinney Mental Grant. Yes, uh, board, last time I was here, we talked about the McKinney Dento uh, asking approval to write the grant. And if you remember, uh, we wanted to write that grant as a consortium. Uh, so we did that. It's a regional grant that we applied for. And I'm happy to announce that we did receive $75,000 a year. Uh, it's a three year grant. Uh, that's based on the numbers that we anticipate identifying and serving that are homeless in not only our district. But we partnered with the Parksville Community School Corporation on also Rock Creek and the Academy. So those uh, other entities, we've got uh, numerous partnerships, the biggest is with communities and schools. So it's going to allow us to offer before and after school tutoring through communities and schools, and it's also going to offer uh, and give us the opportunity to reimburse ourselves for the cost of transportation. Thank you. Board do motion? Move to approve the McKinney Vento grant. Questions or comments on the grant? Just thanks for working with me. Um, all those in favor of um, accepting the Kenny Vento grant? Signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Yes. Uh, yeah, I'll do it over one, two. Is it did it come up on No, it's fine. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, right, check in the Beforehand. Cassie Head Start Food Service Agreement. Yes, uh, Head Start is going to rent three portables uh, plus a bridge from us, and we have a year to year contract with them to provide breakfast, lunch, and snacks. Um, the breakfast was $1.84, last year it was $1.79, lunch is $3.41, and next year it's $3.31, snacks are $1.84, snacks, and it's $1.24 Friday year. Um, the contract was dated August 1st, 2019. Because the reimbursement rates did not come out until after the start of the uh, service again. The agreement has been reviewed by Mrs. Gellhammer, so we're asking the commission to approve the Cassie uh, Food Service Agreement. Thank you, Dr. Dyke. For the motion, uh, Madam President, I move to approve the Cassie Head Start Food Service Agreement. Thank Sorry. you, Mr. Patrick. Thank you, Dr. Clayton. Questions or comments for? All those in favor of approving the Cassie Head Start Food Service Agreement. Renewal signified by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Thank you. Dr. Michael, thank you. Thank you for being ready. Dr. Rutledge, thank you for being ready. Chad, thank you for being ready. Thank you for all of you being ready. Um, Go Solutions Contract. All right. That's nine or nine. So nine and nine. We'll, let's do this. Let's do okay. it. Um, this contract is our annual renewal of our existing contract with Go Solutions to continue to build Medicaid for counseling, transportation, OTPT, and speech. This is a continuation of services with no changes. The cost will be paid out of federal dollars. Thank you, Dr. Hartledge. Board have a motion. Madam Chair, move to approve the Go Solutions contract. Thank you, Dr. Baker. Second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Brock Walter. Questions, comments on the Go Solutions contract? No. All those in favor of the renewal of the Go Solutions contract, to are saying aye. 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 Thank you, Dr. Hartledge. Um, the next is your is asking your permission to um, receive our high billing grant funds in the amount of $68,984. Um, the purpose of this grant is to support students identified as high billing in grades K through 12. The grant is sponsored and supported by the Department of Ed. Through these funds, the curriculum material supplies um, will be purchased to support a high ability students as well as professional development presented by IDOE personnel to district teachers to support high ability students. Thank you for the motion. Move 
move to approve the liability grant funding. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Second. Thank you, Doctor. <laughs> uh, cool. Questions or comments on the high ability grant for All those in favor of accepting the high ability grant with the sum of $68,984. So you're probably saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Next. Um, we are asking permission to submit the Indiana Early Literacy Intervention Grant. We have received an allocation of $35,284.69. This grant will provide funding to purchase materials which will provide strategic professional development, work to focus on core literacy instruction and intervention for our early um, primary grades. Thank you, Board. I need a uh, motion to approve the submission of this grant. I move to approve to submit the application for the 2019-2020 Indiana Literacy Early Intervention Grant. Thank you, Ms. Gokey. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Perkins. Questions or comments on the grant? All those in favor of approval of the submission of the grant signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Uh, the school improvement plan. That was a super fun read. I appreciate everyone who was on this. <laughs> um, as you can imagine, reading all those plans of hundreds of pages, it is a lofty task. Um, pursuant to Indiana code, all public schools, including charter schools, and state accredited non-public schools must complete a school improvement plan with input from a committee of individuals interested in the school. The uh, school improvement plans have to be submitted to the Department of Education, typically by June 30, but because of the change in our testing this year, um, they allow us an extension to allow schools to have time to analyze their scores and make adjustments in their plans and goals for the upcoming school year. And these are all due uh, no later than October 11th. And this allows schools to um, consider all of their data and make those adjustments. Thank you. Do I have a motion to Madam Chair, I move to approve the Indiana School Improvement Plan. Thank you, Dr. Mike. Second. Thank you, Mr. Patrick. Questions, comments? Just a quick comment. I, I can't vote to approve because I didn't give a chance to read through all of them. We just got these Friday. Uh, Thursday. Friday. 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 Um, how will the plans, so it's a two-year plan for Maple and Spring Hill. Um, but they'll be opening for consensual, so how does that work? They worked collaboratively on their plan, both staffs together, but they have individual plans, but basically their, their goals and um, the action steps within the goals are very similar. And technically, they're two separate schools. We will have to apply for a new school number in the spring, and then they'll merge and they'll start all over on their accreditation and accountability. That's how that works. Um, I noticed that part of you and their action items, so there's like the action item and then there's who gonna, who's going to do it and then there's when it's going to get done. And I noticed that part of you, and I was going through because I remember being in the classroom and thinking like who's doing the work because if the teacher's doing the work then the teacher's learning and if the kids are doing the work the kids are learning. So I was going through the action items see like who's doing the work and it's like administrators and teachers, administrators and teachers. Part of you did have a team parent liaison which I thought was really cool. And so I know it's in a couple of years that I really challenged the schools to think about like who is doing the work to improve their schools, whose responsibility is it? And of course it's teachers and administrators, but what about the parents? You know, what if, who's doing this? Like, what about the kids? What kids, what is, they have no responsibility in improving their school? Like that's um, something we can think about. I said they read their moms on there. Yes? I said this before. Yeah, well, it's only have one minute. Any other So I'm just, I'm just wondering if we can, plan a little better um, next year. I, I've never not voted on the improvement plans, but I, I, in good conscience, I can't. <coughs> Any other questions, comments? I do. Um, your um, director of elementary and the director of secondary reviewed all these. Did you have to send any plans back to the schools to tweak? We had some minor tweaks uh, with different buildings. Um, okay. So Actually, we have a process in place where they all come in and we sort of review them holistically together. Um, it is, if you look in the plan, it is our data-wise process, which we, as we do school visits and we meet with our principals, administrators, and building leadership teams, we talk about these plans all year long. And certainly if data comes in, they make those adjustments. And then once they're finally due to us, then we divide them up amongst our central office staff. We each review them with a checklist. Actually, that was in the folder as well. And we provide feedback to our principals. And then they submit it a second time. 
and then we provide feedback again to the final step. They were all due to us on Wednesday to be able to upload and should have been completely ready to roll with their new data because they had to sub-aggregate or disaggregate their data from our new iLearn, which we did not get that back until right. just yeah. recently. And like Ms. Gilby, I, I did not review them and I always review them. Um, part of that was my problem because I didn't know how to open Google Docs. I didn't know how to do that. <laughs> So, no, I didn't. I didn't know how to do that. I couldn't do it. My computer kept on no. But um, I trust Ross' um, thoroughness on um, looking at these plans, and uh, I will vote to approve them. You said you had lots of highs on them. And I did notice that New Washington Old High looked differently than everyone's else. When I asked, he said that it was because they really, because uh, they've been doing that data wise, like 100. And right. That's why there's a and, and please know, it is a, a working plan, a plan in progress, because as soon as, you know, we're constantly looking at the learning center problem and the problem in practice, and they do many cycles within the big cycle, and as things get stronger and better, they use their walkthrough data, those walkthroughs happen with their directors and their leadership teams, um, when Mark goes to visit as well. So it's, it shouldn't be just set and sit on a shelf. It should be a constant action plan that we're always striving to be better and looking at ways that we can make improvements um, for both our students and our teachers as learners. Well, with all the iLearn issues that we've faced this time and the data coming back late, I understand that I agree that we need more time to be able to review those as well. If you can work that out. And, they, and in the past, too, we've also gone through phases where we do like a summary for right that as was well. Good. Um, because it is a lot um, yes. to try to read through all. I think one of them had 50 some odd pages. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? I just appreciate your work on it. I trust you. <laughs> and I know it's a living, breathing document. So I'm All right, all those in favor of approving the Indiana School Improvement Plans submitted by each of our schools um, and Dr. Cartlidge, student comments, say aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. Title II, Part 8, Grant Fund. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, we are asking for your acceptance of this grant. The purpose of Title II, Part A is to increase the academic achievement of all students by helping the schools and districts improve teacher and principal quality and effectiveness through this federal program, state and local education agencies um, receive funds on a formula basis. And our grant has been approved in the amount of $355,080.25. These grant monies will cover salaries for certified instructional staff at Thomas Jefferson Elementary, New Washington Elementary, Charlestown Middle School, and Parkview Middle School, who will de deliver daily instructional coaching and professional development on data analysis academic standards assessment and rigorous instructional strategies. Part two of that grant um, is to provide high quality professional development with expert consultants and conferences to help all students develop the skills essential for academic success through effective instructional practices. We are seeking your approval to accept this grant in the amount of $355,080.25. Board, can I have a motion, please? to accept the Title II Part A grant funds. Sorry. Any questions or discussion? Yes. Um, the, these grant monies are only for Thomas Jefferson, New Wash, Charlestown, and Parkview? Yes, because they do not qualify under Title I. They're not and, Title I. Okay. Right. And so this funding helps to support their academic improvement coordinator, which qualifies underneath all of the guidelines. To the old professional development grant. Okay. Yes. Gotcha. yes, sir. I've asked the question before, and you've you answered me every time. But to clarify, maybe for some constituents that may be listening to, do these grant funds help to cover some of the cost for, or maybe they do cover all the costs for professional development training in relation to what, what your description says here? Well, it doesn't cover all of our professional development for the district. Right. But this particular grant is specifically to be used for that purpose only. Okay. And the federal grant dollars are very specific on what you can write them for and be approved. And then they come, you have 
paperwork all year long of staffing and reporting that has to be done, and they do audits <coughs> regularly to make sure that what we say we're doing, we're doing. Some of them have to be supplemental to our educational fund, so it needs an addition to, um, and each one of them is a little bit different. So when we bring in somebody, if you ask for approval to bring in a consultant that gives us all the class tower With training for our training for our, our teachers, mm -hmm. this helps or could help to uh, defray some of those costs. Absolutely. Okay. In fact, we have been very careful. We try to cover all of that right now with grant funding. Oh, great. I mean, it doesn't cover all of it, but we do the bulk of it and the largest expenses we cover through grants for obvious reasons. And one other thing I'd like our constituents to think about is, as you just mentioned. There's a lot of paperwork that goes along with these. So for us to be able to keep our educators up to up to speed with the newest data that they need to have, it does cost administrative staff in the in the administration building. So yes, sir. it's a point because people are your top baby. They tell us that. So Thank you. other questions or comments? All those in favor of accepting are we accepting grants or going for grants? With the, we are accepting the grant. All those in favor of accepting Title II Part A grant funds, they probably say aye. 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 That's the total now. All those opposed? <laughs> Thank you. It's a grant. Okay, again, this is a school improvement grant. Um, so a couple of our schools have received this. This particular grant is for River Valley and Bridgepoint. This is a consulting contract with Kathleen Wilson. It is for the purpose of providing PD and coaching specifically to teaching math standards conceptually with both River Valley and Bridgepoint. This will consist of four days of on-site professional development at Bridgepoint Elementary in River Valley this school year to support the development of conceptual math instructional units and problem-solving tasks through vertical curriculum alignment. <coughs> This is an area when we look at all that data that's in those school improvement plans, this is an area that we struggle with across the state. So the professional development sessions will be a continuation of the work both schools have done through previous trainings as part of the Balanced Math Framework Initiative. They also support our coaches, um, so that that trickles down to help all of our teachers. The cost of the professional development services is $12,500, which includes a consulting fee of $2,250 per day, plus travel expenses. These expenses will be paid from the school improvement grant at each school. Thank you, Dr. Hartwich. Board, do you have a motion? Madam Chair, I move to approve the grant uh, the consulting contract with Kathleen Wilson. Thank you, Dr. Lee. You have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Bolter. Questions or comments, Board? Does the state provide a list of um, consultants that meet certain qualifications? They used to do that. They used to, and I think they may, but it changes constantly. Okay. All right. Any other questions or comments? All those in favor of approving the state grant consulting contract with Kathy Wilson, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Title one agreement? Okay, a couple weeks ago, you allowed us to apply, and then we received over $1.9 million for our district, and this is part of the red tape that, yes, we have to continue to support and manage throughout the year if we want to receive those dollars in our district, and somebody has to do it, and that somebody is me. And this is um, annual renewal agreements for contracted services with our non-pubs. We talked about there's a, an element of that that we have to allocate a portion of that to our non-publics and our um, neglected institutions. So these are contracts that we have to, these are required, the federal government requires us to have these in place in order for them to allow us to have them allocated monies. And these are for Sacred Heart, Child Place, and Our Lady of Providence High School. And Thank all you. of the, the things that are gonna happen from these contracts are paid out of those title dollars. Madam Chair, I move to approve the Title I agreements. Thank you, Dr. Bateman. Do I have a second? I think I missed the subject. Questions? All those in favor of the Title I agreements with our non public schools, I would say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Agreement with Dewey. 
Okay, this agreement is with Dr. Dewey Hensley, and this is to um, help launch our Leadership Academy. I'm very excited about this opportunity, and I would like to preface <coughs> this that all of this is being paid for part of the Title II that you just approved is covering these expenses, as well as our Title IV dollars, um, which help to support professional development, as well as a well-rounded education. And this Leadership Academy will have components aimed to support systems which increase achievement, a professional culture of collaboration, and informed decision making. The overarching goal is leveraging leadership to change the trajectories of children's lives. The Leadership Academy will focus upon the following initiatives. There is a district delivery planning. Um, Dr. Hensley, I've actually worked with him in the past. He is amazing, has an incredible biography if you've had a chance to look at that. But he will actually work with our academic team <coughs> as well as Mr. Lofner to make sure that we are working cohesively in all departments and that we are optimizing these federal dollars to really make a big difference in our work in academics. Um, the second layer of that is to provide professional learning sessions for our leadership teams and our administrators. We've scheduled four times between October and February with time in between to debrief and um, do focus on some book study material and how those, what implications that um, work that we do will have upon our schools and our students. And there's four different sessions with different topics. The first one will examine, examine six specific systems that great leaders build to make great schools. Um, number two and three will really focus on learning intentions and success criteria. We all are working so very hard, but how can we ensure that we are getting the success that we hope to achieve that we've included within our school improvement plans? And then finally, um, there will be a focus our last session. Um, we talk a lot about cultural competency, um, but we know that our, school, our students um, that are living in poverty struggle the most and they need the most support. So this will specifically focus on creating poverty considerate schools where all students can grow. Um, the final layer will be a consultancy team. We will identify three schools that we feel like need the most support. We will work as a team, um, not just with district leadership, but we will pull in experts within our other schools and um, work with three schools to try to help them overcome some of their struggles and challenges. Um, then the outlay is on a table on the next page. The professional learning sessions, there will be four of those. It will be at $3,000 each. There will be five district leadership team planning sessions at $1,500 each. And then there will be three full day consultancy team visits. And those will be at $4,000 each. The total of these expenses is $32,435.65 or 68 cents. All expenses are written into and will be paid out of federal to and federal Title II and Title IV grants to specifically support professional development. Thank you, Dr. Hartridge, for your Sorry, I motion. Group to accept the agreement with Dr. Hensley and the leadership camp. Thank you, uh, Mr. Garbolger. Do you have a second? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Hawkins. Questions or comments for All those in favor of approving the agreement with Dewey Hensley? and schools program and this is a grant that Jonathan Jennings would like to submit um, they've outlined all the different materials that they will need to launch their archery program the total cost of this package is three thousand two hundred fifty nine dollars the National Wild Turkey Grant Program will cover five hundred dollars of the total cost with the Indiana NAS grant agreement the school will end up being responsible for five hundred dollars and they are requesting permission to submit this application in the amount of $2,259. Thank you, Director Rutledge, for that motion. Madam President, I move we accept the uh, 
grant application for Jonathan Jennings. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Second. Second. Thank you, Dr.
Jeffersonville High School will be 10 a.m. and Saturday, June 13th, Charlottetown High School will be 1 uh, p.m. I ask the board to approve those dates. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Board has a motion. Move to approve the 2020 graduation dates. Thank you. Congratulations, Toby. Second. Thank you. This is uh, questions or comments, for All those in favor of approving the graduation dates, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? And last but not least, the school calendar. Thank you. Uh, the administration is seeking board approval of a balanced calendar model for the 2020-2021 school year. This is based on feedback that we got last spring from staff and also in our, you know, our goal to try to align our calendar closer to Prosser uh, so our students aren't off school when Prosser's in session. Uh, within this calendar, um, we have three building e-learning days on September 8th, 2020, February 15th, 2021 and April 29, 2021. Two of the e-learning days will include staff and professional development. The first teacher day will be Friday, July 24th. And we've made a pledge to our teachers that that's going to be their day, you know, to do their work. And we're not going to have meetings uh, in terms of principals having meetings and things like that. That's their day to get ready for the school year. Uh, certified staff will have this day to prepare their classrooms. The first student day will be July 29th, 2020. Uh, we will set aside the first week of spring break uh, to be used for snow makeup days. However, we want to use as many e-learning days to make up snow days as we can. But if that gets excessive, you know, obviously, if we have a really, really bad winter next year, you know, we're not going to be excessive in how many e-learning days we use. So we we may end up using some of those makeup days that first week of spring break. And, and obviously we ask our parents next year not to plan vacations on that first week of spring break. Make sure they plan on the second week of spring break, just in case we have a real bad winter. And the goal here is really, uh, number one, to start school as close as we can to August 1st and end school before Memorial Day. We do not want to add days on after Memorial Day. Uh, and that's the goal of this calendar. So I ask the board to approve this, this calendar for the 2020 and 2021 school year. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Board have a motion. Madam Chair, uh, it's very difficult for me to ask you. Uh, I'd like to move that uh, we approve the 2020 21 school calendar. Thank you, Director Clayton. Do you have a second? I second. Thank you, Mr. Rockett. Questions or comments, Board? This helps our Prosser students. Yes, absolutely. Right. It's, yeah. it's almost identical yeah. to their calendar. Right. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned something about uh, advising parents possibly in the school day. I mean, uh, some days will be in the first week. I'm assuming you're just speaking of this calendar then, right? Right. And we, we will be sending that out multiple means because we have some parents that contend they don't go on social media, some don't go on email, some don't take their snail mail, I guess. I don't know. We'll, we'll communicate that as best we can to make sure they know not to plan vacations that first week. Thank you. Other questions? All those uh, in favor of approving the tenth school calendar for the 2020-2021 school year. Same time I say aye. 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 All those opposed? Thank you, Gordon. Um, and again, Kevin, thank you so much for being ready and stepping up there. That would um, I really appreciate that. Last on the agenda is public comments and Mr. Felix is going to speak. I won't keep you long. <laughs> I won't go on as much as anyone else. Uh, board, Mr. Lochner, uh, these things here. First of all, we've had a tumultuous couple of weeks with the strategic plan. I know that. And uh, I want to applaud all of you for the hard work you've done. And also, um, Mr. Lochner, it took a lot of courage to do those four meetings. You got beat up pretty bad on something like that. <laughs> all right. It takes, it takes a soldier to do that. But uh, I remember in the not so distant past, that would never happen. Um, our superintendent, I don't think, would have listened to the community the way you have, and certainly not his staff for choosing the best path for you. Um, and let me say, really, that's how things are supposed to work. When you're spending the public's money and creating and eliminating jobs, programs, um, you're supposed to listen. It's our money you're spending. 
Um, and I'm not exactly sure how this plan is going to change in the future, nor am I entirely going to be in favor of it. I'm sure of that, of what remains. But I must say that as a teacher in this corporation, I am extremely pleased with the process that's got us where we are tonight. Um, the community and those affected have spoken. The board's listened to everybody. You've listened. But I know you've inherited a very difficult situation. Um, and I think that the association and administration are actually listening to one another. That's very, very important if we're going to succeed. It gives us a chance to make positive change. Uh, progress, in other words, we'll progress together. Your transparency, here's the biggest thing. Your transparency and your honesty since your appointment and board too have been what are earning you the respect of your staff and, and the greater Clark community. Um, and in closing, I would also just like to say, board, you're equally responsible for all this and for hearing this and all that good stuff. And I think we're starting to turn the corner on climate change here. It's important. Our climate needs to be one where people want to work. And I see that and I feel it every day. Now, I do have one point of order, though, before I leave on the strategic plan. I heard you say that, that the related arts have been resolved. And then you said something about a broad spectrum. So I'm still a little bit confused on what's going on with related arts. So a point of order would be a little clarification for these folks. They deserve it. Their lives depend on it. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. All right. Um, okay. Uh, last is board reports, requests, or comments. Is going. No, ma'am. Miss <laughs> 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 Hargett, I um, have to spend several days, two days, with some other board members in Indianapolis. <clears throat> yeah, so that was super fun, wasn't it? I'm exhausted. I've been up. We didn't get back until this afternoon. Mm -hmm. I, I thought I would be able to hold it like the whole board meeting, mm -hmm. you guys, especially when you guys started yeah. it off. Thank you. 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 We may take some, but we're not taking the majority of that out of tax dollars. We're taking that out of local tax dollars. We're taking that out of the money that is available, and our staff and uh, cabinet members have gone way out of their way to try to do the very best they can to obtain as much of those funds, as many of those funds as possible, to help our teachers to be able to improve their, improve their skills. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. I just want to say one thing quickly. Um, we, as we talked, Dr. Knight did a really good job of explaining uh, quite in depth about finances and, uh, you know, they went through a bunch of stuff and it's very difficult. Um, I know the senior board members have a lot better grasp on it than, than me as a new person. Um, I do know that I feel like the TIF money it cannot just be addressed by us. It needs to be addressed by everyone. And, and it, sometimes if it's the hard thing to do, it's usually the right thing to do. Um, I struggle with that. It's not just state legislators, it's local political officials. And and we need help with it. And I, I don't I don't want to over you know extend how I feel about it, but I'm very passionate about it and I think there's some things that could already be done. We might not be in some of these positions if we've been getting tip dollars. And we didn't need to get fifteen percent of it. We just you know we're working together in this community. I think it's important that we really work together and not just talk about it together. I'm sorry, that's all I have to say. I just had, I just had two eyes. Uh, Dr. Deichel, um, or where are you going? Dr. Deichel, I was at the meetings in Indianapolis. I was curious, this one guy said that for energy, I don't know if it was a Duke rep or whatever, but we don't have to put any money, it won't cost us anything. So I'm gonna to try to find that information because I already have it that you can contact that person to see how we can have not pay for energy. 
that's part of their um, new solar program. Okay. It was a solar guy. So you're you're familiar with that. Oh yeah, Todd uh Possibly have a little look into it. Okay. They did mention Todd. It's something about it only cost us a dollar. I don't know if it looks weird, but I gather that information. I want I want to thank the cabinet, uh, Dr. Hartley, I want to thank you for uh, getting these grants and putting all the extra work in it and, and everyone that worked with you. Uh, there was one thing that I found very interesting, and that was in a, a coaching seminar. And around the state, they're trying to change the, the perception of the coaches and coaches that are for themselves to go on for, and further their careers are the coaches that is for kids. And what I found interesting is that a person that teaches art, teaches math, English, will allow, they teach a certain way, but our coaches are allowed to say anything to kids that they want to, grab on them, whatever. But we don't tolerate that with a very professional teacher. So I felt that very interesting that they're trying to change the climate of how these coaches are dealing with kids and be more kid oriented. Uh, you can get more out of, a, uh, out of an athlete. You don't have to scream at them. But I think they've done seeing the Bobby Knights and all that, the, the Bear Bryant's, and Woody Hayes, and you know, that people won't be like that. But then you have to understand you may lose your job like they did also. So that's all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I just want to say what you've heard a little bit tonight, and that is about the TIF money, um, it's campaign time in our local areas. And so this is the time to ask those questions. If you go to any kind of political events, ask those questions. The more they hear from our people, the more they're gonna realize that that could affect whether they're elected or not elected. Thank you. Um, and I just, again, I think everybody reached out. I know most of them are gone and some of them didn't even uh, thank you, Mr. Felix, for what you do for teachers and uh, with the relationship with the board with Mr. Lochner. Um, we, we really are listening. You know, this past couple weeks has been crazy with the, the strategic plan, but it's good. I think it ended, um, you know, I mean, it's not ended, it's not over. We still have work to do, but we've been working so hard. Like the Ms. Perkins said, we just got back and, you know, the whole way we're like, okay, how can we do this? How can we make this work? You know, we're, and we'll, you know, he was there at the conference and every time we saw him in the hallway, we're like, what about this? What about this? What about this? What you think about this? <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, I, I wish things were different. And, you know, we went, Mrs. Patrick said if she won a lot, she'd like to win the lottery and give us $20 million. <laughs> um, so if that happens, so pray that I won the lottery. That would be good. <laughs> uh, but anyway, thanks. Board members, too. Yeah. Yeah. Board members, too. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll give you the numbers. I'll give you the number of zeros that uh, Jeffersonville's given us in two months. <laughs> 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 Are they Mr. Locker? Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 Uh, first of all, thank you all uh, for coming out. Like I said, last week was a long week. Um, I don't think I got home until 11 o'clock each of those nights. But I would do it all over again because I just strongly believe that's the way, um, as Mark said, this process should work. Um, and if I ever get away from that, you need to tell me. Uh, I, just, I just totally believe that's the way things should work and be open and honest and know that we're not always going to agree, agree on everything, uh, but at least everybody's going to be able to speak their, uh, their ideas and express their opinions. So, that was very important to me uh, that we did that last week. And like I said, we got some excellent feedback on things, uh, not just in the meetings, but in the numerous emails that we all well, got up here. Yeah. 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 So it was good. Uh, in regards to the related arts plan, um, what we want to do, just to clarify that, is basically spend the next month to two months in study. You know, we're going to dig into that a little deeper. Uh, we're going to do more research. I promise you, as the association, president you know that we will communicate on that you know uh, we'll, we'll once we get to a point where we feel like we have enough information to proceed forward or not proceed forward you know we're going to communicate with you we're going to be very open and honest about that um, 
before we ever would decide to bring something to the board, you know, we're going to sit down with the association and talk about it. So, but we, everybody up here felt like we needed to study it a little more. Thank you. Right, I can, think. Never mind. can I have a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. Thursday. Hi. Thank you guys for those who stayed. You didn't have to do that.